His daddy can talk. Look who knows so much, huh? Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Please open his mouth. Now, mostly dead is slightly alive. Now, all dead, well, with all dead, there's usually only one thing that you can do. What's that? Go through his clothes and look for loose change. We looked at the parable of Jesus, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and he found a man on the side of the road. Do you remember? He was half dead. But today we're going to talk about a man. This isn't a parable. This is a real story that happened in town just like Del Rio. There's a man that was all dead. And we're going to see what Jesus did to the man that was all dead. It reminds me of a story back when we lived in Canada. You know, there's some real serious white-tailed deer hunting to be had up there. And... Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, be a good steward of a really nice buck. 27-inch spread, guys, for you who keep up with that sort of thing. And so I called my friends, these students, and I let them know I was coming home, deers in the back of the truck. And when I got home, they were waiting for me. And so I pulled up. We were all standing around looking at this nice deer. And one of the students was a vet student. And she was in veterinary medicine school. Ruth Swatsky was her name. And I said, Ruth, do you think you can bring that deer back to life? And she said, I'm just studying to be a vet, Robert. I'm not Jesus. <laughs> well, today we're going to look and see what Jesus did to a corpse. But so we don't miss how dramatic an event was, I, I, I asked Marilyn to help me. She's going to be playing a song. You'll recognize it, I think. It was a song written by Chopin. Go ahead and start, okay? You've heard the song, haven't you? Yeah, Frederick Chopin wrote that song, and then it was played at his own funeral, and then it kind of became a traditional funeral dirge. In fact, for those of you who are old enough to remember when JFK was buried at his funeral, they played that song. Okay, what if, you know, it's not in our tradition to play songs like that at funerals, but uh, many of you have attended funerals in this building, haven't you? And at the front here, there would have been a, been a, you know, a table with wheels on it, and it would have had a coffin or a casket. And there would be, you know, in our tradition, a lot, of, a lot of American funerals, it's an open casket, so you can actually see the body of the deceased. And what if we were having a funeral this morning, and it was a solemn occasion, and we were all, you know, celebrating life and actually mourning death. And Jesus walked in the door. And Jesus walked into, he came, encountered a funeral, and he walked up to the funeral. And we're going to read the story in just a minute. He spoke to the man, and you know what the man did? He got up out of the coffin. We're going to look at that story in just a few minutes. Thank you, Marilyn, for doing that. She knows everything, doesn't she? <laughs> she really does. And, and, you know, it wasn't the only time that Jesus did that. There are actually three stories in the New Testament of Jesus raising somebody from the dead. In the very next chapter, there's a story of the same event. We're going to be in, in Luke chapter 7 in just a minute. In fact, you can go ahead and turn to it. It's really easy to remember the reference. 7, 11. Luke 7, beginning at verse 11. And in the very next chapter... You know, he raises someone else from the dead. And then, you know, the time that he raised Lazarus from the dead, it was even a little bit later. And in that case, there was no mistaking about it. In fact, they warned him. He went to the tomb where Lazarus had already been buried three days earlier. And he said, open the tomb. And they said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. It, it's going to stink. And he said, open the tomb. And so a man who had been in the tomb raised him back to life. Well, that wasn't what Jesus just did every once in a while. It's what Jesus does. And all of us, you know, if whether it's a funeral of a person that we've loved, uh, some of you I know have even attended the funeral of your own children. I, I can't imagine that. But it's what Jesus does. And whether it's the death of a child the death of a parent or another loved one, or even the death of a dream. Anybody had a dream die? I had a dream die this week. So I need, I need resurrection power in my family's life this week. And so whatever 
it is that has died in your life, guess what? Jesus is in the business of resurrecting and bringing back and giving to life that which appeared to be dead. I love what uh, uh, T.D. Jake said, and I owe this to Sue. If you can go to that next slide for, uh, for me there. Um, T.D. Jake said that a setback is a setup for a comeback. And we're going to see that happen in the life of an individual today. And uh, we're going to celebrate the fact that that's the kind of thing that Jesus does. And that I need that, him to do that in my life. And uh, we need that to, him to do that in our church. So we'll be watching for him to do so. First of all, let's talk about the setback. What was the setback of this lady? You can go ahead and be turning to Luke 7 if you'd like to. And uh, we'll read the story together here in just a few minutes. But... To this day, a 10-minute walk from a little town called Nain, it's close to Nazareth, and uh, close to the Lake of Galilee, uh, there's a cemetery on the outskirts of town. You know, every Sunday morning when I drive into town, what do I get to first? The cemetery. Back when we lived in Canada, we didn't only go deer hunting all the time, we also did ministry. And uh, one of the places we did that was a little town called Leoville. And every Wednesday afternoon, a bunch of the college students and our family would all pack up and head up to Leoville. And we did a backyard Bible club in the backyard of a family there. They didn't have a church there that had a building, but they had a house church. And so, so we did this back, backyard Bible club. But the first time we drove up there, Chris, our son, was five at the time. We were driving into town. We came to the town cemetery. As we drove into town, Chris said, Dad, a lot of people die in Leoville. <laughs> well, it was, it was like that cemetery outside of Leoville, outside of Nain, 10 minutes walk from town. is a cemetery. And uh, Jesus had just come from, from not raising someone from the dead, from healing, though, the servant of a centurion, an army officer. And so that day, a lot of people joined his band. And so when they left the home of the centurion, they were going to Nain. And so Jesus and his disciples, it says a large crowd followed. And as they came to town, it's like you, so many little towns, they got to the cemetery first. And on the way to the cemetery was this other crowd. And so it was the funeral procession. Now in our culture, this is what we do, isn't it? If you're driving down the highway and you see a funeral procession coming, what do we do? We pull over to the side. We wait in respect. Wait for them to pass. But in the first century, Jewish tradition, if you were walking down a road and you encountered a funeral, funeral procession, what, guess what you did? You joined it. Everybody would join. And so the group actually got bigger. The closer they got to the, to the cemetery, the bigger the group would. Well, here comes Jesus with this big crowd and at just the right time, not too early, not too late, at just the right time, they encountered this funeral possession. So that's the setup. Let's read that together if we can see the next slide there, Bruce. This is a story of Jesus raising a widow's son. So we'll do it like this. I'll read it out loud, and you can watch and see if I get it right. Okay? I'll read the story, and you let these words paint the picture of this dramatic scene that took place. This was not a parable. This is an event that happened in a town called Nain. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her, and when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then, he went up, and he touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up, and he began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Come back. They were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said, God has come, get this statement, God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. What 
a great story. Now, if something like that happened in Del Rio, wouldn't it be the same way? Everybody would be talking about it, wouldn't they? You're not going to believe what happened at First Baptist Church. They were in the middle of a funeral, and they were playing the song, and Jesus walked in, spoke first to the widow and then to the young man. He told him to get up. He got up. Guys, let's, let's don't miss that. This really happened. And when Luke wrote this story down, people who were there that day were still alive. And if that were not true, they would have laughed him off. This story would have never made it to 2016. But because the people were there, when they read, I was there, they would say, I saw that happen. And so the stories that Jesus wrote about were all confirmed by people who are still living. And that's what happened. Well, let's dissect this story a little bit. And uh, we see that his, this was the, the only son of a widow. And let's think about it. Things had started out pretty good for this lady. You know, every little Jewish girl's dream was to grow up and marry she had done that. Her dream came true. And then every Jewish married couple hoped for a son. Sorry, ladies, don't, don't attribute that to me. But they, they did. And guess what? They had a son. So it looked like, man, things are on the up and up. This is going pretty good. But then things started falling apart for her. First of all, it was her husband who died. And so she was left a widow. And uh, at least she had a backup plan. She had a parachute. Because remember, in the first century, it was very uncommon for a lady to be able to have a job that would support her and her family. But then her son died. And guess what that was? It was a sentence to destitute. She was probably going to be a beggar for the rest of her life because there would have been very little chance that she would ever be able to have a job and support herself. So you see how badly the dream died? You know, the dream of being married died. Dream of having a son, and the son died. And so this was where the, that lady was in her life story the day that Jesus came along and encountered her. And just like, you know, last week's story about the, the priest and the Levite, they saw the half-dead man. They saw him. They had a choice to make, didn't they? He walked by on the other side. And I see Jesus coming into town with his group. And imagine the contrast. Jesus' parade group had just come from a, a, a man, a servant, being healed. And so they were like jubilant and loud glad. And then they came across this other parade, this procession. And the mood was totally the opposite, mourning. In fact, the way that that procession would look, there would have, it would have been led by a group of paid mourners. And they would be singing songs that would do the same thing to that group that that funeral dirge by Chopin does to us. Been very solemn, but they would have been wailing and loud. Paid mourners in the front leading the way. And then the widow would have been following them all alone, all by herself. And then behind her, the men, the pallbearers, we would call them today, would have been carrying her son on an open mat and we've seen those kinds of funerals on TV, haven't we? You know, in the Middle East, they still do it that way. They carry the body, and it's wrapped up in cloths, but they carry the body. It's not in a coffin. It would be carried on a, on a wicker mat. And so Jesus had a choice. But look where his attention went first. Look in this story. What was the first thing? He saw her. And he was... He was not distracted by the paid mourners. He wasn't distracted by the crowds. He wasn't even distracted by the crowd that was following him. His attention was fixed on the one who was hurting. Somebody's asked, which child do you like the most? The one who's hurting at any given time. And so Jesus saw the one in the crowd that was hurting the most. And he spoke to her first. See what he said? It kind of sounds cruel, doesn't it? He said, don't cry. I mean, this lady has every reason to cry. And Jesus says, don't cry. Because he knows what's about to happen. That wasn't cruel. Now, if he didn't do anything for her, that would have just been cruel. But he knew what was about to happen. 
And then the story says he went over and he touched the buyer, it's called, and, you know, the mat. It's kind of a, what do you call those things that the ambulance drivers have? And they, gurney? Gurney, yeah, it would have been the equivalent of a gurney. It says, you know, the, the word in the story there says he touched it. That sounds like this. But that's not what the word means. The word is more of one that goes up and that, like you would grab something. So he really, he grabbed the gurney. And, and he had to grab it because it was being carried by men. They were going with some momentum. It was the weight of the body. And he grabbed it in such a way that it stopped everything. He stopped everything. And then he spoke, young man, get up. He raised up. Yeah, he raised up. So guess what was restored that day? Not only the life of the young man, but his mother's hope was resurrected. And her dream that had died was given new life. And in most of us, well, if you've lived long enough, you've lived long enough to have a few dreams to die along the way. I remember when I was younger, I was in my 20s, I was already in ministry, and, and uh, I hadn't had any sad stories yet. I hadn't had any of these kind of crises. In fact, I hadn't even had a dream that didn't come true yet. And I, I knew it. I knew, wow, things are going pretty good for me. But I would invite others who had been through the dark times, others who had had dreams to die, and I, I knew that I needed them to be able to speak to my students because they could speak out of experience, they could speak with authority, and they knew what it's like to have Jesus come along and resurrect them back up out of a dream that had died. It was powerful when I would get them to do that. First time I saw it, I remember the resolve. I need to find more guys like that who have enough miles on them, have enough years on them that they have stories that they can look back on and having been rescued by Jesus, having been resurrected, their hopes and their dreams, even when bad things happen. So I did. I was real, real careful about that. Because there's a lot of things that we can learn from this story. If we'll just go ahead and go to that next slide, we'll see that. C.S. Lewis says, is, is in fact, it's in the dark times that we're in a position to learn things that if, if the light stayed on forever, we wouldn't even get it. We were talking about in Sunday school class this morning. Why would God have made their ears deaf and their eyes hear? Maybe so the contrast would be so great when they did hear and so great when they did see. You see, it's coming from the dark times that we know to celebrate the light. Amen. It's coming from the times that our dreams have died, that when they're resurrected, we know to give God credit for that. I can honestly say, looking back on the times of my life, when things did not go as I'd hoped and things had not gone as I'd planned, in retrospect, I look back and say, that was better. It was better that my dream did not come true because now I know what it's like to be resurrected, to have my hopes given to me again. And for, for when, a, when a dream dies and doesn't come true, I know what it's like for Jesus to walk in. And make it good again. I know what that's like. So we have that to learn from this lady's experience. But let's not miss this. His heart went out to her. We don't have a high priest that doesn't have feelings for our infirmities. But just as we do, he feels our pain. I get your pain. You know, Jesus felt for this lady. And that was in contrast to one of the real prominent religious practices of the day. We know the word still today. You ever hear of the Stoics? You ever hear of someone who is stoic? They look like this, unmoved by emotion. The things around them, no effect. Well, the Stoics thought that of God. And this is what their, their logic was. You know, they said that if, uh, for example, if I can say something that would make you glad, they would say that that means that I'm, I have power over you. I can influence your emotions. Or if I can say something, if I can bring news or do something to you that would make you mad or make you sad, then that would imply that I have power over you. And this was their thinking. Nobody has power over God. Nobody can make him feel mad or glad or sad. 
And so God must then be stoic. He must be oblivious to feelings. Well, what Jesus did that day countered that assumption about God. But they really believe that God doesn't care, that he's incapable of caring, because that would make him weak. But Jesus expressed deep care. It says, his heart went out to her, the words in the text. His heart was broken for her. When he saw somebody hurting, he hurt. He hurt with them, and he hurt for them. And that, that term, you know, his heart went out to her, is only used five times in the New Testament. Four times of Jesus, and the other time was the Samaritan. The story we looked at last week. His heart went out to the man who was half dead on the side of the road. There's a word that the Ketchi people used all the time. When we were in Guatemala, so you know, we worked with a group of people. Go ahead and put that next slide up there, Bruce. The Ketchi people had their own language. They're a Mayan Indian group. And they lived in a world that they were totally not in control of. You know, what happens when we get hot at our house? Change the thermostat. We're in charge of the weather. What happens if our car breaks down? We take it to a shop. We get it fixed. You know, we're in charge of so much of the stuff that goes on in our lives. The catchy people live in a world, they're not in charge of anything. Life happens to them. Weather happens to them. Sickness happens to them. It's uh, folks whose children have a 45% uh, uh, mortality rate. Almost one in two kids dies in infantry, as an infant. They're not in charge. A lot of stuff happens to them that they have no charge over. Uh, and even the life expectancy raven adult, 55 years. Yeah. Well, they live in a world that they have to look to God for help all the time. And one of the phrases they repeated uh, over and over again. I want, I want to teach this word to you. Nashnau likagwa. Can you really say that with me? X sounds like S-H. Nashnau likagwa. And you say, ah. You stop it fast. And the A is underlined in kagwa because it's an elongated verb. Anyway, uh, say it with me because I love hearing that word. It means a lot to me. Nashnau li kagwa. What they were saying is, God knows. You know, over, over the bed of a sick child that was just almost sure to die, you would hear them say, Nashnau li kagwa. They knew that God cared. He, not only did he know it was implied, he's heartbroken with me. I'm not walking through this alone. Nashnau, mikagwa. God cares. That's the first lesson that we have to learn from this story right here. So whatever it is, whatever's the dream that's not coming true, the dream that's been shattered, the death of a child, the death of a parent, the death of a friend, nashnau, mikagwa. So let's go ahead and go to the next screen. He cares. That's what that means. He cares. So the first lesson that I learned from this story, God cares. But then added to the fact that he cares, he was not powerless. We add the power of God to the care of God. And so let's think of it. Jesus spoke. It happened. Power. Power in the spoken word. Wasn't the first time that happened. You know, in, in John we read that Jesus was there at creation and not a thing was made, but that was made through him and by him. And how did God create the whole wide world? He spoke. He speaks. It happens. And how many times have you been in one of those dark places, in the death places, and you hear a word from God, changes everything. Even if the circumstances don't change, God cares, He's powerful, He can, He speaks, and it's as if there's resurrection even when there's not, when hope is restored. God cares. He speaks, it, it happens. He's, he cares, and then the next slide says, he can. It's interesting to me, on Sunday mornings, 
See, I know what I'm going to try to say when it's my turn. And when the song starts saying it before I get to it, that is so cool to me. <laughs> and I don't know if you, you couldn't have noticed it the way that I did today. But those of you who think back on the songs we sang today, it's like I sent you my notes. You know, where are you, Ravi? I didn't send you my notes, did I? Yes. <laughs> Come on, work with me here. <laughs> but I was sitting right down there, and I was seeing the songs, and I'm thinking, man, that's cool. We were singing songs that were a perfect setup to this message that I was going to try to communicate today. So good. Jesus can revive the dream that seems to have died. Son or the daughter who strayed, is that the dream that's died for you? Maybe the loss of a child, some in this room, you've experienced that, you've done that. Uh, what about, you think this even applies to churches? In case you haven't noticed, we've had a little bit of a setback. You know, six months ago, there would have been more people in the room, wouldn't there? Six months ago, Monday morning, when the guys came up here to count the money, they'd had more money to count, right? Yeah. Six months ago, we had four staff members, or four and a half, or five, or something like that, depending on who you're talking to. And uh, today, we have two and a half. I'm the half. <laughs> We've kind of had a setback, haven't we? But guess what? A setback is a setup for a comeback. Amen. And we just saw that in this story. When I go home on Monday nights, I tell Kelly about y'all, and I say, they're in a perfect place for a comeback. I, 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 that's what I say behind your back. I don't just say that in front of you to impress you or to kind of try to encourage you. I mean that. I think the setback is a setup for a comeback. And that's exactly what happened in this lady's life, and I think it can happen in all the dreams that we have. And all the dreams we have because he cares and he can. And we can trust in him. Go to the next slide. We can trust him. This week on Monday afternoon, or it was actually Monday late morning, I had uh, kind of a brunch, lunch with a couple of us in the room today. And I uh, just wanted to get to know them a little bit better. And we had a good visit. But they told me a story of a dream that had died. They have a daughter, and they hadn't seen her for seven years. She walked out on them. She separated herself from them. Man, I, I can't imagine the hurt that. Seven years, seven Christmases, no word. Seven Mother's Day, like next Sunday, no word. Seven birthdays, nothing. We had that visit, and they shared that, and I appreciate I, that I was trusted with that story. You know, when you share somebody with somebody your heart aches, you're really sharing yourself, aren't you? So we finished up, and I went ahead and excused myself. I need to get back down here to church, and I walked out. And uh, I got a call on Tuesday and, uh, from them. And they said, you're not going to believe what happened yesterday. Now, what happened? Well, when you left, it wasn't like seconds after you left, I felt a tap on my shoulder. And I figured it was you, because you hadn't even gotten far enough to get gone yet. He said, I turned around, and it was my daughter. She sat down with us, and she said, I'm back. No hard feelings. Showed pictures of grandkids they hadn't seen. Reconnected. Recon this is not hypothetical. This isn't preacher talk. You know, a setback is a setup for a comeback. And guess how dear it is, the fellowship with that daughter now, because of the separation. Well, if there had never been a separation, you'd just take it for granted. How many times God rescues us from dreams that have broken and disappointments and things didn't go the way we, we thought. Sometimes just because we live in a world that's broken, we live in a fallen world, there are corporate consequences. I suffer and you suffer from the fallenness of living in this world. But sometimes because of even things that we do ourselves. We do. I've done things that, you know, my setback was on me. 
The reason I had that, I, I, I'm the blame. I get credit for that one, you know. One of our students in Canada, her name was Holly Hosty. And her story started like this in our lives. I got a call from a concerned grandmother. And she got my name somewhere, and she called me on the phone. She said, my granddaughter's at the University of Saskatchewan. She's making bad choices. She's taking up with the wrong crowd. I'm just worried to death about my grandfather. We'd, granddaughter, would you give her a call? And I said, yes. I've always said yes to those kinds of calls. You know how many of them count for much? Not very many. But I always make the calls. Well, I called Holly. I got her and said, hey, Holly, my name's Robert. Your grandmother called me. <laughs> I said, I'd like to meet you. You want to meet in the student center? She said, sure. We set up a time. We met together, met Holly, and uh, just let her know what we were doing there and the group that we were part of, the Baptist Student Ministry at the University of Saskatchewan. Invited her to our home because that night we were going to have a bunch of students over and a great group of people. I knew if she met them, she would like them. And so, surprise, surprise, she did. She came to our house that night. And guess what? Holly was in like Flint with that group. She joined in that group and, you know, tried to take care of some of the problems that she had had in the past and did away with them, and she became a leader on our team. We, the next spring, spring break, we did a mission trip to Mexico, Acuna, right across the river. So Holly came from Saskatchewan with us with a group, and we went and stayed in Camp Gethsemane and did mission work that week. She's been here. She's been to Delray. We bought, we bought groceries for that group at the old HEB store. She's been here. Well, then, uh, I mean, God really was doing work in Holly's life. And that next summer, you know, there were opportunities to be summer missionaries. Guess where? In the valley. And she had had a good experience in Acuna. And she said, I like doing that. I want to go do that again. So she signed up. And she was a summer missionary down in the valley. But that experience didn't go the way that everybody hoped it would. There were some problems with that. And she actually had a bad experience. She came back. And she kind of, you know, kind of, kind of fell off the wagon. And uh, kind of got disconnected with that group. And I've had my versions of that too. And that's what she did. And then she ended up pregnant and not married. She went back to Estevan, a little town four, four hours away where she lived. And had a little baby moved, went back home with her mom. And, and then, you know, kind of got going again. Came back to the University of Saskatchewan. Met a wonderful Christian man who loved her. Loved her little boy. And they got married and... Back on track with God, and so her dream that had died was coming true again, but better than it had ever been before. And guess what Holly did in 2007? In 2007, she and an American lady recognized there was a big need in a, t in a place called Taiwan. And as shameful as it is, there's this deal called sex tourism. And apparently Taiwan is one of those destination places. And what they have in Taiwan is a whole bunch of teenage girls who get pregnant. And their parents shun them. And so guess what Holly and this lady did? They started a home for unwed pregnant teenage girls. Because guess what? It's what Holly had been. God turned her broken dream into a wonderful dream. And gave her a heart for other people who are in her position. And this morning, Holly is in Taiwan providing a safe place for little girls who are pregnant. Is that cool or what? Does that sound like resurrection to you? That's as dramatic a resurrection as if Jesus had walked in that door and a dead person got up and walked out of a coffin. He's in charge of making straight licks with crooked sticks. That's all he got. A setback is a setup for a comeback because we can trust him. We can trust him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for stories like this, especially that impressed a man who was a physician, that you did that work, and and we have it today. And not only a great story about a great comeback from a lady who seemed in a very, very bad place, but it gives hope for me today. It gives hope for us today. And Lord, we do. We know you care. We know you can. And we know we can trust you. We, we, we entrust to you to bring us back as a church. 
and the things that have happened in our lives that have hurt us, we look to you to bring us back, to resurrect those dreams and give us new life again. We really do. We expect you and we watch for you to do that. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.